Honeybees are not native to North America. The first record of bees in the New World was an entry in the shipping manifest of a British ship named the Discovery, which landed in Jamestown in March of 1622, making Virginia America's first home of the honeybee. They brought them because they used the products of the hive in their daily life. Honey was not only a sweetener, it was a food preserver. Um, the wax was used for candles, obviously, leather work, gunsmithing or metalworking. Uh, and they also uh, would coat like a paper material and make like oil cloth or windows, you know. So it was a lot of different uses. The Native Americans had no name for bees and called them the white man's fly. So they, they put these hives down in the ship's hold where it was nice and cool, and they brought some extra honey with them just in case. But the bees don't eat much while they're cool and dormant, so to speak. Um, but they would keep them down there in the dark so they wouldn't fly, and they kept them covered. And if it got too warm, they would cover them with a wet burlap and just keep them damp and cool. And for three months, they took to get over here. <laughs> That's how they would transport them. And they lost a lot of bees too, but you know, the, the ones that made it came here, there was nothing to keep them from multiplying, so it made out pretty well. Within a short period of time, there was a lot of bees uh, in the colonies or in the United States, what was to become the United States. In Virginia, as in the rest of the world, honeybees are at great risk. It is called colony collapse disorder, with losses that can range as high as 45%. Colony collapse disorder, or CCD, is caused by a number of environmental and biological factors, but none are more serious today than the Varroa destructor, a parasitic mite that is the vampire of the bee world, feeding on the fat cells of the bees and transmitting viral diseases. Raising mite-resistant queens is the front line of defense against the Varroa mite. We breed queens mainly. We're queen breeders, Russian queen breeders, so we're breeding for mite resistance and, you know, behavior, different traits like that, specific traits. My dad and I and my mom, we own the business Richland Honeybees in Virginia, and we, are, we belong to um, an organization called the uh, Russian Honey Bee Breeders Association, and we're certified Russian breeders, um, one of, I think, like 14 or so members in the United States, um, and we're the only qu Russian queen breeders in Virginia. American fowl brood is the big one that's a spore-forming bacteria. Uh, it can live in a hive for hundreds of years, and hive wouldn't wear, and it'll wipe out a colony, and it'll go through an operation in a couple years and wipe you out. Um, it's very persistent, it's a spore-forming bacteria. Uh, European fowl brood is not a big deal, as, as much of a big deal. Uh, it's a stress disease like shipping fever in cattle, uh, but it's manageable with antibiotics, you know, or a good honey flow or something like, you know, change the queen uh, is a good management for stuff like that. Uh, chalk brood is the same thing, it's a fungal disease. And there's a lot of viral diseases that are becoming more prevalent only because we have varroa mites now that more so than we did before. There was viruses out there, uh, paralysis virus or sac brood virus uh, that were never really an issue. Every once in a while I would see it, I might see a cell or two in a hive, no big deal. Uh, but now with mites uh, coming along to transmit viruses and, and interfere, inter compromise the bee's immune system, we're seeing a lot more problems with bee viruses, old ones and new ones that have come in since mites have arrived. Uh, here in Virginia, we have a speci specific genetic line. All the breeders have different lines of genetics that we're breeding from. Um, and then we'll kind of trade back and forth different genes. But the whole purpose and the mission is just to breed these mite resistant honeybees because they, the bees originally are from Eastern Russia where the mite was as well, and so they kind of um, evolved together. And the, that that race of bee, the Russian honeybee, really has um, developed 
traits of mite resistance. And so you hear about seed colony collapse and things like that. And we're really trying to hone in on getting rid of these mites. And, uh, and our operation in Virginia is, is so far doing a great job. We're seeing great results. The importance of managing bees and protecting and growing their flowering plant forage is imperative to our food security as it is estimated that bees are responsible for one out of every three bites of food we eat. A bee colony is a superorganism, and all members are interdependent, from the queen to the youngest nurse bees. The members' roles are determined by age and sex. The queen lays her eggs, the drones fertilize unmated queens, and the workers forage for stores. Honeybees and humans have what is certainly the essence of a mutually beneficial relationship, Bees provide food and important products, but also provide culturally as symbols for hard work, cleanliness, and order. When you know how bees operate, you pretty much have a handle on how the world works. Dan Price turned a hobby as a beekeeper into Sweet Virginia, a foundation dedicated to educating children as to the importance of bees and their role, not only agriculturally, but also in our society. The way this began, uh, I gave maybe many years ago, more than 10 years ago, I gave a jar of honey to a friend after I had begun uh, the beekeeping. And it had taken a couple of years to get my first jar of honey. Uh, and he came back about a week later and said, um, you know, could I have some more of that honey? And uh, I said, sure. And he said, I'm not sure that you understand my wife is a honey aficionado, and she tells me that this honey is the best honey in the world. There's nothing like it. So it was really that conversation that launched it beyond a hobby into more, of, more production of honey, and then ultimately into this foundation. The honey that's, that's made here is as artisanal as it gets. This is straight from wildflowers that I've planted, from the from the flowers that are, are right here around this farm. This is straight from those flowers, turned into honey at beehives here, and then processed very minimally into and put into those jars and, and, uh, and distributed. It's a, it's a uniquely delicious Virginia product. Over the years, I, I sort of discovered that, um, that people are fascinated by honeybees. Um, for good reasons, They've, and, and humanity has been fascinated by honeybees really since the beginning of recorded time. So it goes across centuries and across cultures. Uh, and I discovered that when I took it on as a hobby here. Uh, honeybees, the, the way that they operate uh, is just a wondrous thing. Uh, and when you begin conversations, when I began conversations with people, they were drawn to just the wonder of how this creature operates. So over time, uh, I kind of just thinking about what's the way to really do some good with this hobby. I saw that children in particular uh, were just uh, wide-eyed at the description of what's going on in a beehive. So that experience of just with kids and people being here and showing them, I decided about 10 years ago that I was gonna turn this into a, an environmental education foundation and really share this, uh, this wondrous creature with elementary level children. I thought there's an opportunity with, uh, with kids at that age range to really, uh, particularly in this time where everything is so electronic and everybody is kind of more removed f than ever before from nature, that this creature provided a vehicle to have children begin to get a glimpse of just how, how awesomely ordered nature is and how all of it is connected in one big system to make the world go round. And honeybees just showcase that beautifully. Some say the beekeeper is as busy as a bee, 
It's a year-round process, but highly rewardable when it comes time to harvest the honey. Beekeeping and producing excellent honey and hive products is a passion of mine. Number one, it's a life-affirming experience to take care of another life form. Number two, it's a tremendous intellectual challenge to deal with each colony, which is in itself a super organism, to understand what you're seeing, how you can help the bees. That is the essence, not making the bees work for you to help the bees. A beehive consists of a few basic parts. Looking at the hive from the bottom up, you have the stand, which keeps the hive off the ground. Next is the bottom board to provide an entrance. Up from there are the brood boxes. This is where the queen lives and lays her eggs. Above the brood are the honey supers. Above the supers is a two-part roof, consisting of an inner cover and finally the outer cover. Harvesting honey in Virginia can begin as early as May and continues through June or July. To harvest honey, you start by blowing a little smoke on the bees to calm them down. Once the outer and inner covers are removed, you are looking at the exposed upper supers, which hold the frames. A fume board can be used to encourage the bees to move downward in the hive. The honeycomb, consisting of the wax and the honey, is in the frames. The upper supers are removed and checked for capped honey. Usually, a minimum of 75% of the cells or the combs on the frame should be filled with honey and capped with wax before they should be harvested. The supers filled with capped honey are transported into the honey house, where the extracting process will begin. First, the honey goes into a warming room, where it is warmed to hive temperature, right around 90 degrees. We don't heat that honey. We do keep it warm. The interior temperature of the hive is 88 to 92 degrees, and that's how the honey flows the very best. The frames are removed from the supers. Here, the supers are rolled and scored, which opens the honeycomb caps. An uncapping fork is used to work the cells around the edges of the frame. Once all the cells are uncapped, the frames are loaded into a drip tank where gravity pulls the free-running honey into the bottom of the tank. This honey, as well as the honey from the uncapping process, is unfiltered but strained and raw. It contains all the pollen and other nutritional benefits. The frames are then loaded into a centrifugal force extractor, and the honey is spun off of the frames and collected at the bottom of the extractor. It is then strained and collected in five gallon buckets. The wax collected in these processes is melted into blocks and can be used in a myriad of manufacturing processes, including pharmaceuticals, candle making, needlework, and carpentry, among others. The honey is then poured into bottles and packed for distribution. Here, the sweet Virginia honey is packaged in gift boxes. Small producers call themselves artisanal honey producers, and most of their operations and processes are accomplished with simple tools and by hand in small batches. Large commercial operations like Gunter's Honey in Berryville, Virginia, use automated machinery and production lines to process their honey. Gunter's, a father and son operation, is the Mid-Atlantic's largest honey packer. Uh, the bee is, is incredible what, what God has created there and I, I just think it's wonderful and, and I, I really enjoy it, working with them uh, and uh, for what they can do and 
and they give us a product that is second to none. At peak operational capacity, Gunters can pack up to 100,000 pounds of honey per day. Mr. Gunter began in 1965 with two colonies of bees. Today, he brings in honey from various locations, including Virginia. We're in Berryville, Virginia, Clark County, uh, outside of uh, uh, Winchester. Um, uh, we make some really good honeys here. If, if Mother Nature smiles on us, uh, locusts being one, uh, unbeatable. Uh, second to none. Thistle, farmers hate them, beekeepers love them. Makes a, a, a nice, light, delicate honey. And then another one, if you like something more with a little more bite, a little more kick to it, is uh, the tulip poplar. Uh, plenty of tulip poplar trees here in Virginia. Gunters packages numerous types of honey, ranging from tulip poplar to avocado, but their most popular is good old clover honey. Gunter, like the well-seasoned winemaker, blends honeys from various suppliers to get what he calls just the right flavor and consistency. Once Gunter has the blend he is looking for, his honeys are commercially packaged on an automated production line. The Honey Bear is the best seller. The process starts with unloading the honey into large holding racks. This tank holds up to 40,000 pounds of honey. The honey is then filtered and pumped into water jacket tanks, where it is heated and blended. Once properly blended in the water jacket tanks, it is pumped into the filling line. Here, at the head of the filling line, the ever-popular honey bear containers are being set up. The line can handle up to 120 honey bear containers per minute. The honey bear containers, limed up uniformly, are prepped and ready to be filled. The Cazzoli 8-head rotary filler supplies each container with precisely 12 ounces of honey. Plastic caps with an inner metallic seal are sent via conveyor to be twisted onto the containers. We dump the lids into the elevator. The elevator rolls them up to the top. So the lids are either going to be up or down. And what they do is they use air. You know, when you put air underneath of it, obviously it's going to flip it out. But when the lid is actually upside down and the top is down, it's not able to fill a cavity to chuck that lid out. So the lids that it can't chuck out go into the machine the proper way that they're supposed to go in. Note the perfect alignment of the honey bear containers as they move down the line to the lift and peel sealing machine which is the heat inductor that provides an airtight seal for the honey. And as you can see in the cap, they have a uh, silver liner. When it comes out of the machine and it has a lid on it, it goes under uh, a sealer, which uses magnetic pulse. And what that does is that heats that metal up and it actually bonds it with the plastic uh, so that you get your quality seal. Once sealed, the containers move down the line to a laser sprayer that marks the date and product code information on the top of the lid. Next, the containers are labeled on the front with brand and product information and on the back with nutritional information. One dozen 12-ounce Honey Bear containers are packed into each box. The boxes are sealed with tape and sprayed with date and product code information. The packed boxes are loaded onto pallets and made ready to ship. For the commercial producer, the proximity to large East Coast urban markets makes Virginia an ideal location to process, package, and ship products.